we are excited to share with you guys um, and kind of in the spirit of our talk this morning, um, kind of being as action oriented as we can. Uh, so we're going to uh, talk through a, a little bit of self-assessment uh, regarding our area that we'll be talking about today, religious and spiritual competencies and doctoral education with psychologists. Um, so we'll do a little bit of self-assessment. Dr. Sizemore here, who I'll introduce in a moment, is going to be walking us through uh, a lot of the history of this topic and kind of where we're at now and the leading edges of this. And, um, and then we'll do a little application in some of our own courses. So uh, before we dive into all that, though, I just want to let you get to know us a little bit. Uh, so I'm Dr. Robert Pate. I'm the Director of Clinical Training at California Baptist University PsyD Program. And um, I was trained at Biola University, and uh, they do a fantastic job there of doing exactly what we're going to be talking about today in terms of digging specifically into training in religious and spiritual competencies uh, through courses that are intended just for that, and then also through kind of integrating the idea of talking with clients and people that we might be assessing about their faith or their lack thereof, um, just making that part of the process uh, throughout the curriculum. Uh, Dr. Sizemore here with me uh, comes with a 35-year history in the field, uh, doing all kinds of things to promote uh, not only clinical competencies, but also helping people to, uh, to be well-educated when it comes to religious and spiritual competencies, competencies specifically. Uh, he's a past president of Division 36, uh, the Society for the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality for APA. Um, he's written a textbook in the area, um, and he is currently serving as a core faculty member in the PsyD program at CBU and also as the director of of our uh, clinic, the Psychological Services of Riverside. So um, I'll let him share a little more about those experiences when he comes up. Uh, but that's kind of where we come from. And uh, so we are integrated in a uh, faith-based institution. Uh, but one of the things that we try to maintain an awareness of when we're working with our students is that, first of all, not all of our students come from a, a religious background. Uh, many of them would consider themselves to uh, be either an atheist or uh, to come from a religious faith that is not the same as our institution. So we're very aware of that with our students, and we try to uh, maintain that awareness as we talk about uh, these issues of faith and spirituality in the class. Um, so uh, as we think about that awareness for ourselves, we want you guys to be thinking about that as well. Uh, so the handout that just went around there uh, contains the competencies that Dr. Sizemore is going to be uh, talking you through a little bit more in a few moments here. Um, but what we'd like for you guys to do as we get started thinking about this and before we get into the action, the application of this in doctoral education a little bit later in our talk today, We'd like for you to think about where were you trained, and, and for all of us, there will be some kind of formal doctoral education, so whatever program you were in. Uh, but there may also be competencies that you look at on this list where maybe your doctoral program did not specifically address the elements or the competency, but perhaps an internship agency or a, a formal postdoc training uh, may have introduced you to one of these competencies. So uh, we're just going to take a few minutes here, and I want you to actually think about uh, each of these competencies. Don't spend too much time on each one. Uh, there's no quiz at the end of this. Uh, just give it a moment and just look at each one and think, uh, was I trained formally in this or not? And uh, if you've got a pen, great. If not, I think there's some in the back if you want to run and grab that. Um, but um, actually, while you're all doing that, I can run and grab some pens if anybody wants. Uh, but just take a look and see, was I trained in this particular competency or not? And I would encourage you not to think generally about diversity training in these areas, but specifically religious and spiritual competencies. So if you took a diversity course, uh, which I don't think uh, became a thing until maybe the early 2000s, um, if you took a diversity course but they didn't specifically hit on religious and spiritual competencies, um, then uh, don't give yourself credit for that one. We want specifically religious and spiritual competencies. All right, ready to go. Anybody need a pen?
just give you another minute or so here. I know there's a, a front and a back to this. So. <laughs> a lot to consider. Looks like most of you are finishing up here, which is great. So uh, I'm just kind of curious, um, how many of you would you say your, your program hit at, at least half of these, you know, hit seven or eight of these pretty well? Okay. And anybody, was there anybody that just your program didn't touch on any of these specifically? Okay. Um, not unusual. Not unusual. Um, and uh, my experience in talking with... Um, with interns, if, if I give trainings at uh, county agencies in our area, is often that it's kind of one or the other. Either they came from an institution that really focused on that, oftentimes it's a faith-based institution, um, or they've come from an institution that didn't touch on it at all. And they'll say things like, thank you so much for bringing this up. No one has ever talked about this in any of my courses. And to me, that's if it were any other diversity category, I feel like people would just be up in arms about it. Uh, that, oh my gosh, we never talked about race in our diversity class. That would be ridiculous, right? Um, but this thing that is so... Uh, integrated into the lives of so many of our clients. Uh, it's really a travesty that we don't talk about this because it's, it's so important to our clients and they may want it integrated into their services that they receive, whether they're assessment services or maybe more often uh, therapy-oriented services. Uh, so we just want to make sure that uh, through this training you guys get a sense for kind of where are we at as a field when it comes to religious and spiritual competencies and what might we be able to do in some practical ways in our educational settings to make sure that the psychologists of the future are not having that experience where they say, no one talked about this with me and I have no idea how to approach assessing or integrating this with my clients. Um, so many of our assessment documents or our biopsychosocial intake forms don't have a line for this. Um, or if they do, maybe it's just a little throw-in that's with maybe family background or something. Um, so uh, when I ask our students to bring in their uh, intake forms when I teach a practicum course, I always ask them, can you find the part of the form that asks about uh, spiritual background of your client? And most of the time, there isn't anything. So we want to make sure that, that you guys are prepared to make sure that that doesn't happen in the future. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sizemore here to kind of walk you guys through uh, some of the history and where we're going uh, as a field here with this. Well, thank you for being here. I'm a rookie at this meeting, so it's kind of nice to be here and um, get to know some of you. Let, let me start here as a first place of, of jumping into this. I want to be careful that when you hear religious and spiritual, you don't go in your head Christian, right? If, it, if you do, that might be an area to work on right there, right? Because we lump all that together because of where we live. And, you know, America is historically more of a, uh, has more Christians in it, and that's certainly the case. But just as we were becoming more ethnically diverse, we were becoming more religiously diverse. And I just want to make you keen to that, because this is an area where psychology has done a really poor job. And, and I come to you from Division 36, which is my home in APA, um, where we, you know, address this issue a lot, and we've been deliberately trying to impact the literature to make it broader and so if I can kind of in a brief commercial. So my a colleague and I, Josh Knapp, have a new book coming out with uh, John Templeton Press later this year on the psychology of um, um, religion and spirituality of world religions, an indigenous perspective, where we've actually gotten someone from within that tradition to write a chapter to educate us about what it looks like from inside instead of science taking this kind of down the nose look at religion and spiritualities. We're excited to see the cooperation. You all may not expect this, 
but we have Hindus, we have Jews, we have uh, Muslims, we have um, indigenous American chapters, we have African religions, um, we have uh, Chinese, uh, er uh, native religions. So there's a wide perspective where everyone agrees, this is kind of how we cooperate, that sometimes science doesn't look at what it is like to be religious and spiritual. And I think some of this is, it, 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 we want to bring to your awareness today. There's a, there's a checkered history in this area, and I'm very much oversimplifying it. But <clears throat> early in the history of psychology, uh, there was an interest in looking at religion. And William James's uh, Varieties of Religious Experience is kind of a foundational thing for a lot of people. However, it was a kind of an interesting thing. James didn't want to focus on how does religion help and deal with people in everyday life. He was looking at the weird stuff, at the eccentricities, and with an implicit kind of tendency to want to explain it away. That we're going to take science and make all this stuff they think is God and spirits and demons, and we're going to show it's all psychological. And that's a form of colonization. It's a form of trying to take Western ideas and imposing them on religious groups who hold different values than we do in terms of sources of knowledge or reality. Well, but still there was an openness to looking at it. Some of it was positive. A lot of the early folks um, were pro-religion. Freud certainly cast a, a dark cloud over this discussion, who was pretty clearly anti-religion and would even see people with, of faith as being pathological by definition almost in, in many cases. So there was this, this pulling away, this af afraid of it, behaviorism took this another step because obviously how do you, we can't, you know, God doesn't respond to our surveys and so we can't really get a, you know, any information about what that's like so we'll stick with what we've got. So it became kind of sidelined as this thing not discussed about. And this is really true, I want to just kind of say a word or two along the way about undergraduate coursework. You can read an entire book about abnormal psychology and maybe only see the word religion when it's talking about a type of persecution under schizophrenia and not how it plays out in any other aspect of life. Or you look at personality theory and read an entire book that can, purports to explain our personality without even addressing it. And so as in other areas of diversity, that doesn't make sense if we don't, we think we can explain everybody by being colorblind. And so th this is the kind of thing that we're trying to come out of. Even though uh, it is still, by the way, a big part of people's lives. The, a big turn came when Ed Jafransky um, published a book in 1996, The Religion and the Clinical Practice of Psychology, published by this um, strange publisher called the American Psychological Association. And they took a chance to publish this book and it blew up. It was such a hit, there was a need for it. And one of the things that's pointed out in the book, which I think is really important for us to be aware of, is that of all the professions, the mental health professions, people in them are some of the least religious people of any other profession. So it's kind of interesting. So persons of faith are not a minority until you get into a meeting of psychologists or a meeting of psychiatrists or any of the other mental health professions. For whatever reason, there's kind of an inversion of this. And so sometimes, again, that's part of the problem. We think, well, we've risen above it because we have science and we understand people. And then that's not the attitude you want to take into a consulting room when you are talking to a person whose faith is important to them. But we, we can do that if we're not careful. So this stirred this back up and raised some interest. So APA has since gone on to see religion and spirituality as an aspect of diversity. The Code of Ethics specifically includes religion as an area to be respected and considered in working with people of faith. Notice the respected. If someone comes in and they are very hard, I come from the South, I, um, so there's some of these folks down there, these good old boys as they call them down there, um, come in and they're serious about the faith, how do you respect that? How do we do that in a way that honors them and isn't prejudiced against them in some way? 
Well, so there's, the code of ethics touched on this. Other professions have done the same. In fact, we're kind of behind the curve on this. MFTs have done this. Professional counselors have done this. And social workers have done this. And also, these include requirements to address religion and spirituality and incorporate it into training, which is kind of our emphasis here. Well, Robbie's exercise goes to show that a lot of us haven't had this. And even if, you know, some of you may have been in, you know, Christian programs, and maybe you got a lot of this in Christianity, did you get much on Islam? Do you know what to do with a Muslim client? Do you know what to do if someone comes in and their head's covered with one of those things? That we have is this prejudice, right? We kind of, oh, what does that look? And so we don't know, we're not trained, and our students don't address that. And for most people who have a strong faith, these aspects play into their understanding of their world in ways that psychologists underestimate. And so what we have here, if we can go back into a bad area, bad era in the history of our military, we have in psychotherapy a don't ask, don't tell policy, where many therapists do not ask, is faith important to you? Or how do you see any faith or spirituality playing into what you do? Right? We just, you know, we just don't want to talk about it. Because of our reputation in the community, they'll go, well, psychologists don't talk about this, and this is really important to me, but I won't bring it up because I know they don't really probably believe like I do. And we create this really isolation. So surveys show the great majority of clients want to use faith and spirituality in their therapy. But not that many therapists know what to do with that and tend to avoid it. And, and this is a failure, I think, in part of our profession. So groups have formed in the different professions, not just ours again, to develop competencies and guidelines for working with various minority groups. And again, persons of faith are not a minority group, and I know that's a controversial term for some, but we are when it comes to psychology, right? This is kind of a, a minority group then. So, in these broad standards that were written in the ethics code, groups have gone on to develop sets of standards and competencies for different areas. And these are on the web page of APA, and I've given you a link here if you want to get the slides from us, um, where you can view all these. So um, there are things for cultural competencies, uh, LGBTQ competencies, persons with disabilities, aging, and so forth. That when we work, here's some things if you think you know what you're doing when you work with these groups, here's some things you might want to make sure you covered. Okay? And APA, I'm just kind of mentioning this going along, there's a debate between competencies and guidelines and what kind of terminology to use. Um, I'm on a task force with Division 36 where we're um, further developing the competencies you see in front of you. Um, those are kind of a, a starting place. Those are not, um, if I can use a religious metaphor, brought down from Mount Sinai. Um, so um, these are just kind of where we're working. But competencies are skills that a, a psychologist are expected to have. Guidelines are things psychologists are encouraged to aspire to, and that's kind of the difference between the two. Well, leading the way are professional counselors. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing to know. But these they, they have developed not only counsel, competencies, but the competencies which were developed through a CERVIC, if you're familiar, a CERVIC is kind of their Division 36 in a way. A CERVIC developed them, but the entire American Counseling Association has approved these as holding true of what we expect our training to be for all counselors. Um, APA has not done that. What APA has said in terms of accreditation, um, it does not specify that you have to train on how to include how do you understand religious persons, but it is, does consider them a group to be considered in diversity training. So they don't pull out, here's what you need to do with persons of faith, but rather there's more of a talk about they are one of these groups that you need to pay attention to in the areas of diversity. Okay? And one of the interesting things this kind of funny, is they even talk about that. They don't pull this out when they start saying, and when you recruit for your, per, your program, you would want to be deliberate to encourage people from all of these type, 
types of diversities to apply. You know, so I don't know how many of your programs keep track of how many students of faith come into your programs. Or, you know, certainly how many do we have that are Catholic or Protestant or Muslim, or whatever it might be. Um, it's just kind of interesting that we don't often do that, which I think is important things. So we do have certain programs represented here that are specifically religious in orientation, and APA has endorsed that for many years. Um, but it hasn't been clear on recruiting students of faith into other types of programs. And conversely, some of these programs have not been as uh, clear on uh, recruiting students who aren't of the faith into the programs. So it's a little tension there. So what you have is built on the work of Cassie Vietton, who is my co-chair in the Division 36 Task Force, who developed a set of 16, which you now have a redacted version. We kind of kicked one out already. And we have launched the Division 36 Task Force, which interestingly enough, this work has drawn the um, uh, um, interest of a group from within SAMHSA, within the government, federal government, because the federal government sees that the religious community can be a resource to deal with mental health issues. And so they're deliberately wanting to kind of connect these groups a little bit together. And so they've kind of helped um, us get together to talk about some of these. But these are a minimum. Let me walk through them really quickly. You've got them in front of you. I just want to make a comment or two and just kind of show you how they're organized. And, um, and you've had the one deleted. These are tentative. We're going to back up. There are a lot of things, specifically not enough discussion of intersectionality with these. Um, there's a lot of things that needs to be worked done on these. And we have a really exciting task force that's doing that right now. Stay tuned for what we'll be coming up with. So let me do it real quickly. The first three have to do with psychologist attitudes. Psychologists demonstrate empathy, respect, and appreciation for clients from diverse spiritual, religious, or secular backgrounds and affiliations. So again, a lot of the Division 36 talk, secular is considered another character, the category. Uh, there's some really good work being done on atheism and agnosticism now, or non-belief, if you would, or unbelief, um, and different terms are used. But um, all of that is included in being sensitive to that. Second, psychologists view spirituality and religion as important aspects of human diversity, along with factors such as race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, disability, gender, and age. So again, you know, this is where there needs to be a little more development of intersectionality. How does this play? Because, for example, again, coming from the South, if you are a religious gay man in the South, there's going to be some problems that a non-religious gay man in the South might not face. And so there are issues that have to be dealt with that, as we work through this kind of thing. Uh, three, psychologists are aware of how their own spiritual and religious background and beliefs may influence their clinical practice and their attitudes, perception, and assumptions about the nature of psychological processes. Know yourself. Many of us have work to do in being aware of our own uh, psychology and just being around psychologists for many years. Many had this journey. I came from a religious family, and then I saw that that was kind of silly and it was pathological, and I learned psychology and I moved on. Well, that's your story, and that's fine, but that's not everyone's story, and you need to be aware of how your story impacts how you see other people's stories. Then more quickly through knowledge. Psychologists know that many forms of spirituality and a religion exist and explore spiritual and or religious beliefs, communities, and practices that are important to their clients. Let me just kind of put a little yellow mark on the word communities. One thing this area of diversity does set up in a nice way is intersecting with their communities because community is a very important part of many groups. Um, the um, APA president, uh, Rosie, as y'all many all know just her by Rosie, um, has had this emphasis on deep poverty. And we had a long discussion a, a year or so ago um, about that and how if you're going to reach some of these particularly African-American communities in the inner city, they're going to be more receptive from hearing something through their churches than they are from psychologists wandering into town. 
And so there was an effort to kind of how do we funnel this work through the communities that are established and valued there. So religious communities can play a part too. I think that's an important thing. Um, how uh, spirituality and religion can be viewed as overlapping yet distinct. There's a lot of talk in the literature about that. Psychologists understand that clients may have experiences that are consistent with their spirituality or religion, yet may be difficult to differentiate from pathologi psychopathological symptoms. You don't think it's a demon possession, but they might. You may not think it's a haunting of a spirit from an ancestor, but they might. And so there's a tension to this, and we need to be careful that we don't assume those kinds of things especially for indigenous Americans, for example, who have strong beliefs in uh, the spirit world and ancestral spirits in many of the, the communities, that we don't kind of go, uh-oh, I think this is another schizophrenic. We need to be honoring and exploring that with them to understand it. Seven, they develop and change over the lifespan. Um, there's been a long history of research in those areas. Psychologists are aware of internal and external spiritual and religious resources and practice that research indicates may support well-being. You all do know that prayer works, right, in the sense of it enhances psychological well-being for, for many people, right? And so these practices, there's a meditation here, right, today. Um, so some of these practices have value in psychological strength, although some of them can be used pathologically, and so there needs to be some skill to untangle that. Um, so real quickly through these last ones, um, identify spirit to the, um, the th aspects of religion and spirituality that may be helpful or hurtful. Ken Pargament's done some really good work on that, he and his team. Identify ethical and legal issues related to religion and spirituality that may surface when working with clients. And then finally, the set of skills. Conducting empathic and effective psychotherapy with clients from diverse spiritual backgrounds. How do you do that? How do you incorporate that? The goal being, how do you make that client feel comfortable that they can talk about their beliefs with you without feeling judged? And that becomes kind of the target for all this. Um, so several of these just reiterate that. Um, knowing strengths and resources, and um, knowing when to make a referral so that when you... Uh, you know, I don't know what to do with this. I may need to talk with someone. So getting a release and talking with a pastor, an imam, imam uh, or other religious leader in the community can help a lot. But we don't tend to do that. And what's fun about that is then you learn more about that community yourself by reaching out and doing that and involving it so you present what you're doing in a way that's sensitive to that. So... That's just kind of what they are. Now, we're kind of working these through some more. But as they are, Pierce and others in the same group, that includes Cassie Viet and Kim Pargament and others, have developed with the Templeton uh, Grant a, an online training program that's available. So you can actually go online for this program. Here's the link for it. You can get 6CE if you'd like to do it. Um, and they developed it. All these were... Uh, empirically derived standards. The program has been built around research. We're gonna keep you know, revising it and making it more sophisticated. But assuming they get their next round of funding, they're gonna make the, this six hour, these modular units available online free to doctoral students in psychology, right? Stay tuned. Because there you can, you don't even have to kind of mess. Here, go watch this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, check. But that's one thing to be done. But also, I want to stress, that's great, but, you know, you think that if you've covered six hours on ethnic diversity, you, you're an expert? Probably not. So my hope and our hope is to also push to get more discussion of religion and spirituality into the broader curriculum so it doesn't just come up in a specialized course. I mean, I'm sure you don't just talk about um, sexual orientation issues in a diversity course. It shows up in all your classes, right? That's the way it should be, right? It should be integrated just like it is into the lives of the people we work with. And so the goal would be this kind of information is addressed those ways too. So 
Hope this might raises your awareness of the issue. And Robbie's going to do a little more to kind of help you think through what's going on with your program. Um, remember that training and consider maybe your students taking that as a way of trying to cover some of these bases. Six hours, and there is a fee for it now. It's not a large one, but uh, they're, they're moving toward that not being there. And possibly you being more in a, intentional at your schools in integrating some of this training into their curricula as your students progress through the program. Okay, thanks. All right. All right, so that was your meat and potatoes. We've got a little dessert here for you. Um, and uh, let me just, as we're going to be asking you guys to think about how can you do things uh, differently or, or maybe better in some ways, um, I remember having a, a, a t-shirt once that, that said, I think it was in high school at the time, said, be patient, God's not finished with me yet. And I feel like that will always be my story. Uh, and so as much as we're talking about these things and asking everyone to, hey, let's look, take a look at our own programs and how can we do this, uh, we're doing the same thing and saying, how can we be better at this? Um, we are by no means anywhere close to perfect when it comes to uh, religious and spiritual competency integration in our classrooms. We are always working on this just like we are working on any other diversity category. So um, we're, we're constantly trying to get better. So, uh, so what we'd like to do is uh, just first of all offer a couple of examples of some ways that we might do this in our classrooms at uh, CBU, but uh, we'll also ask you guys to do the same in a moment. Um, so uh, as Tim was talking about, there are some different ways to do this. We can do it with a course that's specifically focused on this, like the six-hour CE course or with a, a specific diversity course or faith integration course in your program. Um, but actually, perhaps an even better way to do this, um, especially in the absence of one of those courses, is to just interweave it throughout every course and talk about it as you go. Um, so that could certainly be through class discussion. And uh, anytime you've got uh, some kind of vignette, you know, just to make sure to ask about that, or if you're in a consultation group and you have students that are engaged in practicum to make sure to ask about the faith background of their particular client because that may then inform what kinds of assessment instruments or what kinds of treatment models might be more helpful for that particular client. Um, some practical ways we can do this as instructors in courses. Uh, there are many assignments uh, on my syllabi that include points for inclusion of uh, discussing some kind of religious or spiritual component. So for instance, on my addiction syllabus, our addictions course, um, they have an option to either attend an AA meeting or talk to someone who is uh, currently serving as a sponsor in a 12-step program. Uh, and so they get a few points on that assignment for making sure to, if they've chosen the option of attending a meeting, to to discuss whether or not, and if, if it was, to what degree uh, faith or spirituality was mentioned at the meeting. Um, there may be required readings. I appreciate this article from Naramora. It's, it's an oldie but a goodie. Uh, dealing with religious resistances in psychotherapy. It's a great way to get at some of the things that Tim was talking about a moment ago um, with the unhealthy ways that people may engage in their faith practices, maybe as a defense and as a way that gets in the way of their healthy functioning. Um, I've got an example here um, from our supervision and consultation syllabus um, where uh, a lot of times what we're dealing with is a discrepancy between the faith background of the therapist and that of the client. And so one of the ways that we might get our students thinking about this and engaging with how they might clinically apply this in a, in a real life setting is to integrate it into a vignette. Uh, so this is direct from one of our vignettes that serves uh, as the stimulus for one of our uh, competency assignments in, in this course. And, uh, and so we've got uh, David who uh, you are serving, the student serving as David's supervisor. You learn that he comes from a Hispanic family of modest income, attended weekly services at a Catholic church with his family throughout his senior, in, through, through his senior year in high school, so kind of indicating he's not involved as much anymore. Uh, and so in the first session recording that he shares in supervision one day, he shares uh, the final 10 minutes of a session with a middle-aged African-American man diagnosed with MDD. And, and uh, so we've got the client's background here and uh, said that he's a recent convert to the Muslim faith um, and that he's had some lifestyle changes since that conversion. So it's just kind of a stimulus for getting the student to think through, okay, well, this, this may have been part of the assessment we ask about alcohol use, and so we understand there's been a change in the client's life because his faith is that important to him that he made this lifestyle change. Um, it's, that's just one 
real quick way that we might want the student to engage with this vignette, uh, but from a supervisor perspective, we want to make sure as they're going through how would I address this with my supervisee to say, oh, I would ask them about X, Y, and Z uh, with the client. Have you asked about this? Have you asked about that? In what ways is, is this going to impact your treatment of this client here? So uh, lots of different ways that we can involve this kind of material in our courses uh, in ways that we're already doing with other elements of diversity. So uh, with our last couple of minutes here. Um, I'd, I'd love for you guys to take a look at your competencies list there that you've got, kind of your self-eval list, and just take a couple of moments and, and chat with somebody next to you. If you're not next to somebody, you feel free to get up and move around the room a little, get the, the blood pumping, um, and just brainstorm for a couple of minutes about uh, one or two practical ways that you can apply this now that you could go back to your class and the next time you are updating a syllabus or maybe even when you hit class again on, on a Monday when you get back into town, uh, how can you do this in your, your very next class session or the next time you teach this course? So go ahead and do that and we'll close this up in just a minute here. Feel free to chat amongst yourselves. We don't mind if it's noisy.
Well, I hate to break up what seems to be some interesting conversation here. I, I realize we're, we're about at our time here. I want to give it just a, a moment for questions as we finish as well. Um, but I'm curious, is there, are there one or two of you that might be willing to share what your uh, kind of dyad came up with there, some way that you're planning to implement this? I know there were good ideas. I heard you. Feel free to share your neighbors, too. <laughs> Lehua, yeah. I talked about an exercise I really wanted to do next week, um, thinking about developmental terminology and kind of goal for, for both the community and I think deeply incorporating That's wonderful, and I, I love that it's right away. I mean, it, it, it's such a broad construct that I think it lends itself well to most of our classroom discussions. We can probably drop in a nugget here and there about the issue. So, so thank you for sharing that. I, I'm mindful of our time here. Any questions or, or comments even? Uh, yes, sir. They're not mine, so it's not. <laughs> so I, it's not mine to do that, but um, it is something that uh, Cassie Vietton's group um, and Kim Parkman that that group has been developing, and they've they've got it on this platform so they could reach it out. But they, I think they want to make it more accessible, and they're working on that. It's just a matter of funding. There's a yeah, th mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, now the, in the in the references of the articles to the original works. So if you want to kind of see those, but as far as how they flesh that out, you need to uh, do the program. Uh, also, uh, New Harbinger, Cassie Vietton, and I forget who has her co-author with it, does have a book on religious and spiritual competencies and counseling, and has a little more detail in the book form, and that's from New Harbinger. And they did some pretty good research on, on this program specifically, and to be eligible even to participate in the study to validate the program, uh, you could not have already had any kind of formal training in this. So um, it's, it was really geared toward those at kind of that baseline level. So it'd be great for our students and anybody in this room or otherwise who's kind of fresh in this, as well as a nice refresher in addition to anything uh, if you came from a program that focused on this. Anything else? Maybe one, one final thought from anybody? Absolutely, yeah. Maybe just check with us. We can get you the, the slides or just write it down for you, yeah. All right, thanks so much, everybody.